Hey, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, uh, Mel Herbert here. It's time for another uh, MRAP live, 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 as it were. We've got a, a great cast of characters tonight. Um, let me show you uh, some slides before we get to uh, begin. And uh, there's some very, very important news. Stuart, are you seeing those puppies? We are indeed, Mel. Thank you, Stuart. Um, this just got published seconds ago. It's a pre-publication. You should always be very careful of these. It is a VA study. It's a hydroxychloroquine um, versus no hydroxychloroquine and, and an arm with azithromycin. We're going to get into it a little bit later, but it's very important that you hear about this. The mortality in the hydroxychloroquine group was twice that of the non-hydroxychloroquine group. Now, we'll talk about how good this data is, but it's a very important that you know about this because everything I've seen so far is bad, and this is the worst of them. Um, we should also note that as people are starting to open up um, and get back into society, we're going to talk about the seroprevalence studies. We're going to be talking about the fact that it's still very low. And there's a study that's also in pre-publication that showed that in one restaurant, one person infected half the restaurant. So you might not want to be um, getting real close in a restaurant either. So we'll talk about all this stuff. Um, again, because of seroprevalence, because of how infectious this disease is, I suggest that you go read this article. It's one of the best ones I've seen about what it's gonna look like in the next year or so. And that means it's called the hammer and the dance because we're gonna to have to hammer this thing down by physical distancing. And then we're gonna open up a little bit and then we're gonna to have to hammer it down. And it's gonna be like a slow burn that's gonna go for many months and perhaps uh, more than uh, a year or two. So we're not gonna quickly get back uh, to society. If we do, uh, things are gonna go badly. But again, we'll talk about that when it comes to seroprevalence. MRAP, just want to remind you again that we have all of this open source COVID information. This is part of that. The textbook is getting updated on the daily and we'll be adding uh, the stuff about COVID. In fact, I think we've already put that uh, up there about um, hydroxychloroquine. And I should say MRAP Live in Espanol. Our first one is going to be tomorrow night. We've got a group of people from Central South America and from Spain. They're going to come together in Spanish and talk about sort of very similar to the stuff that we've been doing here. So that's at 2 p.m. Pacific time tomorrow. You'll have to work out what that is for where you live. Um, ICU fundamentals. Sarah Craig just put up uh, this vent management lecture. It's outstanding. A lot of emergency physicians are being asked to work in ICUs. Again, we're going to talk about that in a moment because you're the most uh, qualified people to look after people in the intensive care unit on a, uh, in, on a ventilator in the whole hospital outside the intensivist. So we're seeing a lot of that now that the ERs are pretty empty, the ICUs are full, you're asked to go up there. I suggest you go look at this or watch this video. Um, it's really outstanding. It'll get you sort of back up to speed. So tonight we're gonna to be uh, doing reports from the field. We're gonna do a lot of serological testing stuff. We're gonna talk about risk to healthcare workers, the neurological manifestations of COVID-19, big important stuff on the therapeutics as I've already suggested, and then prepping for the surge if it's not there yet. If you're like lots of people across the country where it hasn't quite gotten there yet, you wanna know how you set up the ear, we're gonna be talking about that. And then what I think is like the most interesting thing I've heard in the last you know, week, which is 10 years in COVID time, is the dermatologic manifestations of COVID which are coming through. So I'm very excited to hear about that stuff as well. Oh, um, there's also a lot of stuff about home monitoring. I've been getting a lot of information from third parties, uh, for-profit, some non-for-profit, about how to monitor people that you're sending home. I just suggest you do a Google search. I don't wanna mention any of them because it'll look like a tacit endorsement by MRAP for them, but they are out there and I think some of them are very good. Um, you should be watching this. It's the best thing on TV now that you've all watched the Tiger King thing. And I'm sorry, but Michael is better than LeBron and it's just the way it is. If you don't believe that, you're wrong. So um, now I'd like to show a quick video um, about Stuart. It's very important that you watch this. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Now, I might be going a little bit you know, crazy because of all of the COVID stuff, but um, I've been noticing that Stuart in our internal meetings here at MRAP often uses words that nobody else knows. Is it just me? So he dropped a decision by Fiat and we went, what is that? So I had to ask Google, 
what that meant. On the website vocabulary.com, they say, you might think a fiat is just an Italian car, but it actually means a legal, authoritative decision that has absolute sanction. From the Latin for, let it be done, the word fiat is a binding edict issued by a person in command. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. From now on, while this pandemic continues, each week we're going to share with you words that Stuart knows that you don't. You're welcome. So uh, I'm really excited about this new segment that we've been developing. Um, so first of all, before we get into the real show, sorry, Stu, uh, let's talk about what's happening on the front line. We've been uh, talking to Swami every week for like five weeks just before they got to the peak. They got to the peak, they plateaued, and now maybe they're going down the other side. So let's hear from Anand about what's happening there now. Hey, guys. Sorry I couldn't be with you tonight. I wanted to give you a little bit of an update from the front lines in New York. I'm New Jersey. I'm in Patterson, New Jersey, right across the river from Manhattan. And well, overall, we are seeing much lower volumes than we were seeing before. I know I've kind of been saying that for the last couple of weeks, our volumes have been dropping. We're probably at, I don't know, maybe 50, maybe a little bit less percent of what our volumes were before and much lower than our volumes were during the true surge. So I, I would say at this point, we're probably about maybe 10 to 14 days outside the surge. And we are seeing, again, much lower numbers. We still have a lot of boarded patients, although that's been getting better as we've been opening up more units upstairs. Some patients have actually been going home. But our ED itself still is on a bit of the fuller side. So we don't have a lot of beds to see new patients in, unfortunately. The patients who are coming in, we're seeing a little bit of a mix. So we are seeing some pretty sick COVID-19 patients still, um, some very low saturations. I had to intubate a patient earlier today who had both alcohol withdrawal and COVID-19. Uh, we've been having some patients with stats in the 70s and 80s, but not nearly the volume of low oxygen saturation patients as we had before. And, and even though, again, we're seeing some of the critical illness and some of the hyperacute patients, we're seeing less of them for sure. And we're also starting to see some non-COVID illness again. Uh, so we've seen some syncopes and strokes and DKAs and the patients don't have any real signs or symptoms of COVID-19. And even when we get labs and x-rays, we're not seeing the typical findings. So there's definitely a decrease across the board, but starting to see that uptick of non-COVID cases. Some other things that I can share that have been working really well, we got some mattresses. Uh, they're massage mattresses, actually, for pregnant women. We got from Rich Levitan's brother, Rob, and we have been using those to prone patients, especially those who have a little bit larger abdomen so they can get onto their stomachs and seeing some really incredible benefits with this. We had a patient earlier today who came in with a SAT in the low 60s. Our non-rebreather went up into the low 80s and proned with the non-rebreather was sitting around 95%, very reduced work of breathing, texting on the phone, um, much better with these mattresses. So I think proning definitely has a place here, whether it is the full prone on the belly or left lateral decubitus, right lateral decubitus, but doing something to keep the patients moving around, not lying on their back. That is definitely the wrong position it's what Levitan calls the coffin position, lying flat on the back. We definitely need to be avoiding that. Um, other than that, the other big thing, and I think we talked about this quite a bit in the last week with Tom DeLore, is the rate of venous thromboembolism is really pretty high. We're seeing a lot of both venous clots, and we're now starting to see a lot more arterial clots. I think we had talked about that. Uh, once in the past, but we are seeing way more ischemic limbs. This is definitely something to look out for. And we've been kind of chatting back and forth about whether there are patients who are relatively high risk. They've had clots in the past, and we should maybe be sending those patients home with anticoagulation from the ED if they're not that sick from their COVID. And, and I, we haven't done this yet, but it's definitely something that we're kicking around. If the patient has a prior VTE and they come in, but they look pretty good, maybe that's a patient that should go home on anticoagulation. We're definitely much more aggressive about anticoagulating from the ED, so not waiting for the inpatient services to do that. Generally, our cutoff is the dimer around uh, somewhere around 1,000 or 1,500. I would say if they're below 1,500 and I'm admitting them, I'm putting them on prophylactic doses, above 1,500 and admitting them, usually we're going with full anticoagulation. We don't have great science on this. There are some articles looking at the rate of VTE, but uh, this is our practice at this point. It's definitely something to look at. It's definitely something to talk about with your hematologist, with your critical care folks. 
So that is the update from the front line. And uh, hopefully I will be back with you guys next week to share a little bit more and to learn from everybody else on the podcast. And we'll see you guys soon. All right. <clears throat> so thanks so much, Swami. Uh, we really hope that uh, things settle down there. The question was whether it was going like this uh, or going like that. And we're going to talk about those curves shortly. Uh, let's hear from uh, Jess Mason on the other side of the country in Fresno. Uh, we have a little update uh, from her. Oh, that's right. I have to, sw I have to uh, switch over uh, the slides as well, but let's get uh, Jess up. Here in Fresno, we're actually still not seeing that many cases of COVID. We're bracing, we're thinking, is this the calm before the storm? But still, no storm is coming. So far, we have a total of 315 cases and seven deaths, and we're still not seeing that sharp incline in terms of our curve locally. All right, so we've gone from New York and New Jersey. We flew across to California. Now, Fresno, for those that uh, aren't familiar, is a little bit inland uh, in California, so we expect it to be a little bit uh, behind in terms of uh, the spread. Uh, let's hear from Jan Schoenberger, our colleague, uh, who's uh, clinical director at LA County General Hospital at downtown Los Angeles. Hey, I'm Rep Live. It's Jan Schoenberger from Los Angeles. I'm here to give you a quick, a quick snapshot of what's happening here on the ground in Los Angeles County. Um, most of you know that I work at LA County USC Medical Center. And to give you an idea of what things look like at our hospital, uh, we currently have 59 COVID positive patients in the hospital with 36 of those patients being in the ICU. Now here in California, we are very grateful that our curve has really flattened. And most of you know from the news that our state took a pretty aggressive social distancing stance early on. And so we have seen um, a little rise in cases over time, but really we've kind of stabilized and we're really thinking at this point, we're not gonna see the kind of surge that we're hearing about on the East Coast. And we are really grateful for that at our hospital. Um, in LA County overall, uh, at this point as of today, we've reached almost 14, just over 14,000 cases in LA County with just over 600 deaths in our entire county. And it's a pretty populous county, so those numbers are pretty good. Now, in terms of testing capacity at our hospital, we still have a really restricted approach to testing and very limited testing capacity. So we're only testing patients who are admitted to the hospital and who are symptomatic with very few exceptions. Um, but for the most part, those are the only people getting tested in our hospital. So that's what it looks like at LA County these days. Uh, we were grateful to have the time to get ready for a surge. And if we do get one, we're prepared. We have tents outside our department that we haven't even used yet. And that's mostly because the geography of our department has allowed us to isolate those cases uh, within one of the pods in our department. So thanks, California, and thanks, MRAP Live. I hope that's helpful. All right. So, uh, Mel, you're back on the iPhone. Uh, no, I'm back, I'm back actually in person. Uh, we just oh, wow. all the lights went out. It was a disaster. Where are we up to? <laughs> Oh, that's fantastic. So we've just heard our reports from the field. We've made our way uh, uh, all the way to Los Angeles. And uh, now we're going to go into uh, the Professor's Dave. Excellent. So um, we're going to start off talking about antibody testing, serological testing. Let me show the slide here. Um, we've got a couple of population-based studies that are out now. And I'm going to start off with uh, Dave Schreiger, because I want Dave to tell us, you know, now we're Oh, I think we lost. It's it's a, probably that same power issue. Um, well, so, Dave, Dave, why don't you just pick it up um, and uh, and and tell us, a, give us a little bit of a primer on uh, the population based screening. Certainly. So the question becomes, what what have we learned this week that we didn't know last week? And the answer is, we've learned a, not, a lot, and we know almost nothing new, uh, which is unfortunate. But that's where we're at right now. So two studies came out which are of um, some consequence. First, from Santa Clara County, uh, just south of San Francisco, is the Stanford group uh, used Facebook to recruit people and then did um, blood tests using a test which was supposed to have relatively high specificity. Um, and they found that in fact, compared to the reported number of positive cases, 
they were seeing seropositivity at roughly 50 to 75 times the reported cases. And that sounds wonderful until you do the math. And all of that, even with the inflation of the published numbers of positive cases times 50 or 75, still results in only between three and 5% or two and 5% of the population having been exposed. So the fact is at this point in California, it appears that social distancing has worked in terms of lowering the number of cases, lowering the, no lowering the number of critically ill and decreasing the burden on hospitals so that it's manageable, but it hasn't worked or it's worked too well in the sense that the vast majority of people are still not immune. And so if we stop doing what we're doing and let people start contaminating each other so the number of cases go up, we can expect we would be ex exactly back in square one. So, you know, the fact is we have not come anywhere near to herd immunity numbers and we're basically much closer to having no one infected than we are to having sufficient numbers in infected. Today, a study was published out of USC, similar technique using Facebook to identify a quasi-random sample using antibody tests and showing that their estimates also show that between, and that we're underestimating cases by, the, by an order of 50 or so, a multiple of 50, and yet still even projecting that number of cases, we're still only at a couple percentage of the population showing antibodies. So we are still far, far away from herd immunity. So what does that mean? That means that if we decrease social distancing without the capacity to widely test both for active disease and for antibodies, and without the capacity to trace contacts, contacts and isolate them in an efficient manner, we're gonna be right back where we started or even worse. So, because one can assume that social distancing is going to fatigue and people are gonna be less willing to do it and less compliant. And uh, we can expect that um, unless we take other measures, this is going to come roaring back. Okay, exactly. Um, so, you know, I, it's funny because I've heard it described as the the worst of both worlds in terms of, you know, we're not, it's not high enough. It's not low enough. It kind of stinks. I, I don't, I don't like where we're at. Um, could, let's take a look at this. Uh, uh, can you see this? Uh, this is coming up for you, the Santa Clara. Yeah, that's perfect. Test. And so this is just an illustration. Let's talk about that. So this is using the numbers from the Santa Clara study. And they said that their test and uh, in the yellow that says one, it actually got rounded. It should be something around 0.98 or so, 0.995. But in any case, uh, if we make that 0.995, you'll see that what you generate out of, and, and you take a 2% population prevalence. If you really believe that 2% of people actually have antibodies. So from a thousand people, you see that 20 have had COVID and 980 have not had COVID. And then you apply a sensitivity of 80%. So you pick up 16 out of the 20 people who've had COVID with a positive test. But on the other side, where the, of the 980 people who have not had COVID, with a specificity of 99.5, as they claim, you pick up essentially five people as false positives and 975 as true positives. That results in a positive predictive value of about 77%. So you would be telling for every 100 people you say, you have antibodies, you're okay, go back to your job, whatever that is, um, go about your business with a little bit less fear. Um, of those 100 people you told that to, only see, it would only be true for 77 because the others would be false positives and they would not in fact have antibody. On the other hand, if some, you tell someone they haven't had COVID, you're likely to be right. Now that's based on this particular test that is claimed to have a specificity of 99.5%. If we scroll to the next slide, Stuart. Yeah, we're at it. There you go. This is the, this is the initial slide. This is the second slide. Perfect. Now, I'm good. Okay. So now... We, and there's a really interesting article in the New York Times yesterday tracking all of these different health entities and private entities that have purchased a variety of rapid antibody tests. And those tests are not showing specificities of 99.5%. They're showing specificities between 50% and 80%. And there are lots of them and people have spent a lot of money for them. So let's just look now, instead of 99.5%, if we're at 90%, Using the same table, the sensitivity side stays the same. The specificity side now, because we're only 90% specific, you now kick out 98 false positives 
to go with your 16 true positives, which results in the green with a predictive, positive, uh, predictive value positive of 14%, meaning if you tell 100 people, don't worry, you have antibodies, um, that would only be true for one in seven. The other six would be falsely reassured. And if we go one more slide deep and we drop that specificity to 80%, now you kick out 196 false positives to go with your 16 true positives, and you have a positive predictive value of 8%. Um, meaning people would be better off not having the test because uh, for every person you told that they were protected, you'd be wrong 92% of the time. So this just points out how important it is to get tests that when you're doing screening on a low prevalence population, you need to have a very, very high specificity. And certainly there is, I mean, it is technically possible to have a very high specificity for tests like that. The question is whether it's technically possible to have a high specificity on a widely distributed, rapid, cheap test, as opposed to some you know, test conducted in an analytic laboratory. And we're not really there yet. So when we take the information we've learned this week, that the prevalence of this thing is still extremely low, we are nowhere near herd immunity, um, that we don't have adequate numbers of tests or tests of adequate quality, and we don't have public health departments with adequate staffing to adequately trace all the contacts, we are really, um, nowhere towards fighting this epidemic, which is uh, humbling and frightening. So Dave, I just wanted to make sure you didn't have any other additional comments. So here's the, um, the seroprevalence Santa Clara study. Um, and I think we've covered, is there anything else you want to mention about these in, in terms of the methodology? No, I think, I mean, we could have a long discussion about whether their sample gotten through Facebook with a little bit of enrichment of zip codes that are thought not to be as participatory on Facebook. We could talk about how well that would actually match a true random sample. But I thought it was pretty clever uh, to be able to do it quickly and get the study out. And it certainly gives us some idea. Are these numbers exactly correct? Is it 50 times? Is it 75 times? Is it 25 times? Uh, they're not exactly correct. They're problems with the sampling. But they're close enough that we can say with some degree of confidence that we do not have herd immunity and that we don't, we're not anywhere near close. And as we all suspected, because of the limited testing and the selective testing, we have grossly underestimated the number of people who've actually had it. Hey, Dave, can I ask you a question? Stuart? Oh. I'm gonna stop sharing for a sec. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, good. I didn't know if everybody could hear me. Hi, everybody. So it, it seems to me that um, seroprevalence studies or testing serology for an individual's IgG which we hope will be protective for the future of the human race. There's kind of two reasons to do it. One is to sort of check what's going on. Our rates of infection such that we're approaching a point where there could be herd immunity. So that's sort of a population level look um, at that question. And then the, the other question is for the individual, if you get a positive test showing you have REGG, with what confidence can you say I'm protected? And since we're talking mostly to healthcare professionals here, that's kind of important because, you know, whether or not you go back to work, what type of work you do, how confident you are when you take care of patients, your individual test result and the confidence you have would be important. That's where the rate of false positives and the specificity of the test would, would really be, be much more important than if we're using the same sort of very good or perhaps near perfect test um, to screen populations at one point or another, right? Absolutely, that's okay. right. There, and, and the other thing I would add is there's been some interesting literature this week about the notion of batch testing. So imagine if you take one drop of blood from, from 512 people and you combine them, but you do it in an aliquot way. So you have like samples all along the way of each dilution. So you could then go and you could do one test. If, you, if it's a really low prevalence population, you do a single test and assuming the test is good enough, you could then say, um, and let's say you're doing this not on antibodies, but a, a PCR test. So you, you had 512 nasal swabs, you put them together essentially and test it. If those 512 people are all negative, you're done. One test and you've screened 512 people. If it's samples positive, then you have to go back to the two prior aliquots of 256 and 256 and test each of those. Again, if there's only one positive person in the lot, you know, 
then you would discard the one that's negative and pursue the one that's positive and work your way down. And you can do the math that if there's only one or two or three people who are actually positive in the 512 you screened, it only takes about 20 tests to isolate who they are. And so instead of doing 512 tests, one on each person, you could actually batch test with a strategy that would allow you to screen asymptomatic populations. So maybe there's a critical factory, a meat packing factory. You could screen that entire population of workers repeatedly using very few tests. And it's a very interesting concept as a way of conserving tests that we would use pool testing rather than one test per person. And uh, it may be a way to get widespread testing in the absence of, of readily available sufficient tests. Yeah, I have, a, I have a feeling that we're gonna, the next week is going to be full of more of these cohorts and we're gonna need to have you guys uh, come back next week and give us an update on where we're at. Um, I have to ask Dave, the, the, the question that's on everyone's mind, uh, you've heard about the people that are uh, testing uh, positive, uh, that think they're convalescent and they're getting positive tests as a certain percentage in all the cohorts. What is going on? Is it really reinfection? Is it just PCR uh, uh, genetic remnants? What's going on, Dave? Which Dave? You, Talon. Dave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. If you guys I have know that, the you, answer. You guys all have excuses. I, I, <laughs> I think you mean Dave Schreiger. Well, I mean, this is something that we've seen. Like, you can find this virus out there with PCR testing. Uh, it's the same issue. You find it floating in the air. You find it on the counters of things. But does that mean it's live and, inf and infectious? So PCR testing is extremely sensitive. And, and uh, just today, I think there was a JAMA article that came out that followed some patients who had gotten better. Their symptoms resolved. Their fever went away. And they were ready to go back. And they kept PCR testing them, and they stayed positive. Now they didn't report whether the you know they sampled them to see if the virus would grow, but there's the, these presumed viral remnants, and, and there is this sort of lingering question like, well, maybe physiologically they're better, but they may still be carrying the virus and being able to transmit it. So we need to do some more work on that, right? Okay, and, and so it it's also, another. It also sort of raises the question about the CDC guidance about return to work, because one of those pathways is to have two consecutive negative PCR tests, but many people, you know, apparently won't have those and they feel right. better. So are they perpetually going to, you know, stay at home, be quarantined, they're isolated, whatever you want to call it until, you know, three months later when these viral remnants go away. We, so there's more we have to work out. Okay, so we're going to keep on this. We're going to keep on it. And eventually, we're going to figure these things out. Um, Dave, I have to and Dave Talon, <laughs> I have to ask you, which okay, let me ask you, which one of you Dave's has received several million dollars, or is about to receive several million dollars to study uh, the risk to healthcare workers in this? And, and what's the update on that, Dave? Yeah, thank you. Um, Unless, Dave, you got a, another couple million dollars. Yeah, exactly. How many million did you get, Shrike? I don't want to be <laughs> presumptuous here. Well, look, um, you know, we're all concerned about our own risk of acquiring this infection when we take care of people. There were two new reports that came out in the CDC's MMWR, which I thought were interesting to discuss today. Uh, one was the first, they reviewed the first 300,000 cases of COVID-19 uh, in the United States where they collected data on the patient's occupation. And when they sorted out to have, you know, um, uh, data that were reliable, they found that about 10% of those reported cases, 10% were healthcare professionals. And if you think about it, 10% of people in the world are not healthcare professionals, right? So that really makes you wonder, boy, our, you know, we, our jobs must be terribly risky. Now, of course, the issue with that has something to do with sampling, which the actual Dave Schreiger, the one who really knows something, could talk to us about, right? And I thought he was going to talk about biases associated with sampling Facebook populations. And I'd be interested in his theories about how different those people are, but I get the feeling that Dave would give that study a dislike on Facebook, right? No, I think, I think actually, <laughs> I think it's a quick and dirty it's a very reasonable approach. It's not perfect. Whether they were able to oversample 
zip codes that are unrepresented in Facebook, you know, we really need to scrutinize that. But as a quick and dirty way of getting a pseudo random sample of the population to see who has antibody, they did it. Are Facebook, than, are Facebook members more social and likely to get infected or are they recluses to just sit at home on the computer on Facebook? What's your theory? Well, um, <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't have a theory, which is why I didn't get millions of dollars to study this. <laughs> okay. But in the absence of a theory, I mean, I think this is an interesting question, but given the other clinical material we need to cover tonight, we should probably kick it back to Stuart and move along. Yeah, no, okay, but let's talk about this MMWR report. So I appreciate that um, digression just for my interest. Thank you very much. So are the, are the overrepresented proportion of cases among healthcare workers really due to the fact that if you're a healthcare worker and you get symptoms, it's much more likely that you're going to get tested and diagnosed than anybody else. I mean, think about how we take care of patients in the ER. If they have mild symptoms, we send them home, say self-quarantine, we don't test everybody. But if it's a healthcare worker, that has implications in terms of transmissibility to the patients we take care of and to if we're infected, then when we can return to work like we were just talking about. The other study that was published in the MMWR about a week ago, I thought was fascinating. And this sort of informs this curiosity we have about you know, what happens if you happen to take care of a patient who's diagnosed with COVID-19 and you didn't know it. This was the very first case in the United States. And this patient came to a hospital in Solano County, California. I think that's in Northern California, right, Stuart? Yeah. And um, so the patient, uh, of course, we didn't have cases of COVID-19. So this patient got hospitalized for um, respiratory distress, had breathing treatments, had BiPAP, right? Had positive pressure, um, you know, uh, aerosolized uh, uh, procedures, which would aerosolize the virus. 121 healthcare professionals were exposed to this patient over her four day hospitalization. And they followed the healthcare workers once they later found out when she was transferred to another hospital um, that she was COVID positive. They looked at 121 workers who were nurses, doctors, respiratory therapists, and they found that 121 who had pretty close exposures, completely unprotected, no PPEs, three of those healthcare professionals got infected. So a little less than 3%. So that, that's, that's pretty interesting, I think, right? So we, I know I took care of a patient I didn't expect to have COVID. I was notified the next day and it, it made me all you know, paranoid and worried trying to think back like how careful I was. But it, it does seem from um, at least this case report that it's not that easy. This, despite Mel's picture of, the, of people going out to dinner and everybody around them getting sick, I don't think in healthcare, it's all that easy to get this infection. There's a couple of questions uh, uh, from the uh, the herd. We have a big herd actually tonight, yeah. um, and I don't know if we have the answer to them. Uh, I heard that. You know, is herd is herd immunity <laughs> dependent on a certain level of titer? Do we know what level of IgG confers immunity? I don't think we have the answers to those questions, do we? No, we don't know that yet. And uh, um, yeah, I think I, don't, I think we have any answers. I wish that we did. Um, yeah. Any other yeah. comments on that? Uh, well, not about herd immunity, but I, but you were mentioning this grant. We, um, I think we brought up at one of the previous MRAPs. We did get a grant from the Centers for Disease Control to answer the two questions we most want the answer to, which is, you know, what is my risk of contracting COVID when I do my job taking care of patients? And um, what are the ways that that risk can be lessened? There's never been an opportunity to conduct a prospective epidemiologic study to answer those questions ever. And of course, the last deadly you know, global pandemic was over 100 years ago. And so um, we are working with CDC and we are working with 20 sites, 20 emergency department sites across the United States to do the COVID study. And COVID stands for COVID-19 Evaluation of Risk in Emergency Departments, the COVID study. And I wanna put this up here to share my screen. Uh, can you guys see that? Yep, we can see it. Okay, so these are all the uh, hospital emergency departments and the site PIs. And we just had our, our kickoff meeting by Zoom 
today and we are going to get going. And I want to just say thank you to the feds and the Centers for Disease Control. Um, the American public is very, very appreciative of the work that all of you do um, as, as emergency providers. And they want to make sure we're safe and we learn as much as we can when we have this opportunity to do that. Um, so anyhow, we'll, we'll give you more updates on the coverage study as we moved along. And thanks for that uh, time to shamelessly self-promote my uh, investigation. Well, it's on behalf of us all, and the information is important to us all. So thank you for doing that. And uh, Peter, you have a follow-up? Yeah, Dave, uh, I just wanted to ask a, uh, a question about the MM MMWR report. It seems to me that having 121 healthcare providers exposed to one patient in their four-day hospitalization might be a bit of an exaggeration. Maybe one walked by the room delivering pizza or, or, or whatever. Uh, that certainly has not been our experience at the Stony Brook in terms of exposure. But I know that when we have, for instance, a men meningococcal meningitis or, or something like that, the count gets extraordinary as to who what might be exposed. But most of those people really did not have a genuine exposure to the patient. So the number may be 3%, but it may actually be substantially higher. Yeah, they, they, um, and they, they didn't give the details, or at least I couldn't find them right away. They or graded the exposures into high risk, medium risk, no risk, low risk. And there was a substantial, I, I would, the over half had either high or medium risk. And so you could imagine, think about a patient who's admitted with a bad COPD exacerbation. That patient is getting a lot of ner close nursing care, respiratory therapy care, doctors are putting the stethoscope on and listening to their chest and getting right in there. It's hard to go back and think about what medicine was like before COVID, right? But that's actually what we did. And this was an opportunity to, to see what usual care, how usual care interacted with a COVID patient in terms of transmissibility. I'm not saying that the risk of contracting this infection is, is negligible or low. It, this just sort of gives us an idea. The study is going to look at uh, risk groups, doctors who intubate, doctors who don't intubate, nurses, and as controls for our risk of just being out in the community and among ourselves, we'll look at other health healthcare staff like clerks. And we should be able to estimate the attributable risk of doing our jobs. And then through looking at some of these specific types of exposures, be able to identify the types of exposures, the types of PPE, which would either protect us or put us at greater risk. So stay tuned. That's what we, that's exactly what we hope to learn. Okay. That's great. And actually we're going to come back to that a little bit from a practical point of view, because Peter has some other comments on staff safety uh, from his experience. I want to bring in uh, our next guest, uh, Evie, uh, Evie Marcolini is uh, a associate professor of emergency medicine at the Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth. Um, uh, and Evie is also, you'll know her from her uh, neuro talks that she does everywhere uh, in AEM and uh, on MRAP and everywhere else. Um, and uh, I like that because I'm also, I've got a little bit of a neuro bent. So I, it's, uh, I, I, I think this stuff is so interesting. And you know, uh, this issue of respiratory viruses causing neurologic uh, features is not a new thing. I mean, they, they all do to some extent, right? I mean, and we all know influenza can cause severe CNS uh, complications, encephalitis. So it's not like a new thing. Um, so uh, it's not completely shocking, but it's happening. Um, and so, uh, Evie, let me start off by asking you, what exactly is the mechanism? Like, what is, is there some science that we need to know here? What, how is the virus actually attacking the CNS? Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for having me. And you're right, coronaviruses are not new. They've been with us for many, many years. Uh, we had SARS, we had MERS, we've had many different coronaviruses and we found these viruses in the brain tissue and in the CSF of patients with many neurologic diseases, MS, encephalomyelitis, Guillain-Barre syndrome, refractory status, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. I mean, we've seen this before. But the interesting thing about COVID-19 is that we think that it is 10 to 20-fold higher affinity to, to bind the ACE2 
receptors than SARS, which makes it that more interesting. So how does it really spread to the nervous system? Well, it's got to start with the ACE2 receptors. These ACE2s are found in practically everywhere in the body, oral and nasal mucosa, lungs, intestines, skin, heart, kidney, and the brain. But most interestingly, there's ACE2 receptors on the lung alveolar epithelial cells and on all the arterial and venous endothelial cells. So think about that. There's, there's a couple of different ways that you can spread the virus to the brain. The first possibility is a hematogenous spread. So gets into the bloodstream and then inflammation and vascular injury breaks down the blood brain barrier and then the virus gets into the neural parenchyma. The second is through retrograde transport. Now here's where we talk about the respiratory epithelium. That epithelium has a high concentration of ACE2 receptors, and we think it's kind of a reservoir. And many viruses, including coronaviruses, have been shown to go from the nasal epithelium, they go past the cribriform plate, they infect the olfactory bulb. Now, interestingly, the olfactory bulb itself doesn't have ACE2 receptors, but when you break down and, and you break down the vascular system around it and you have inflammation, then it invades the olfactory bulb. Once you're there, it's a direct line That's to the, the CNS, brain. the CNS, yep. right? You're right yep. in the CNS and the olfactory yep. bulb. So yep. there's nowhere D further to go. Directly. Um, there's one other small uh mechanism that's talked about called the Trojan horse, which I think is an interesting name, um, where leukocytes who carry the virus transmigrate across the blood brain barrier and get into the brain. So, you know, when you talk about getting into the brain, uh, the latency period for that is about five to seven days. And when you look at the recent study chi from China of 138 patients, they said the median time from onset of symptoms to dyspnea was five days and the onset of symptoms to hospital admission was seven days. Now I'm not making a direct link. And I think it's important to understand that none of the stuff that we know about neuro is prospective with, with respect to COVID-19. We're looking back at SARS, we're looking at MERS, we're looking at different pathways, and we're trying to speculate on how the brain affects the respiratory system and vice versa. So, uh, I know there's not a lot published, but, um, and for those that are worried, that are listening, that are worried about not being able to access the MMWR reports or the study that uh, Evie just referred to, all that stuff is in the chapter. It's all there. It's just a click away. So we got the data there. Um, but uh, what is the spec, like uh, when you're in your business, you see all the cases that you see and then everything neuro out there, everyone sends you, right? You're, you're a kind of, you're an aggregating center because, oh, look what I saw, Evie, what, you know, uh, what is the spectrum of what you've seen out there in terms of the symptoms, the presentations and neuro stuff? And, and of that, is there anything in particular that we should look for? Yeah. So the big thing that everybody's talking about is anosmia and, and problems with smell and taste. And we look to the, the folks who have had the most patients. We look to China, we look to Europe. And in China, that retrospective study where they looked at 214 patients, they separated the neuro manifestations into three different categories. The first is central nervous system. 25% of people had CNS, dizziness, headache, altered mental status, acute stroke, ataxia, seizure, they had it. 9% had peripheral problems like taste impairment, smell impairment, vision impairment, and nerve pain. And another 10% had skeletal muscle problems, which was manifested in an elevated CK. So, so that's China's experience. Now we go to Europe and in a, in a multi-center study in Europe where they looked at 400 folks with confirmed COVID-19. They said, you know, the, the most common symptoms were cough, myalgia, loss of appetite, but over 85% of the patients had problems with smell and problems with taste. Now, here's the interesting thing. You know that you get influenza, you get an upper respiratory uh, illness or something like that. You're going to get congestion, you're going to get inflammation, and, and you may have taste and smell dysfunction. But the interesting thing about COVID is we get anosmia and taste issues without rhinorrhea, without nasal congestion. So that really 
speaks to the thought of going from that olfactory epithelium, I'm sorry, going from the respiratory epithelium to the olfactory bulb without having the congestion to go along with it. That's what makes it different. And then there's uh, some data showing that uh, there's a very high rate of ENT physicians in China, Italy, Iran, who are reporting that they have COVID-19 and many of them having a pretty high mortality. And we're thinking that that's probably because they're doing all those upper airway surgeries, upper airway exams, and they're, they're getting right in there. All right. Um, um, so let's just, uh, just to round things out in our discussion, there's a, there's a, another 800 pound gorilla in the room, uh, Evie. Uh, and that is just like we were talking about code STEMI uh, with Amal and the issues there, whether people are gonna go to cath, people getting lytics in lieu of cath in some places, we've seen the same data for code stroke and for uh, stroke activations across the country, in other countries, uh, we're hearing about it. Um, what's going on and what should we be doing to remedy it? You know, yeah. people aren't coming in with strokes. People are being paralyzed at home for six hours. What are we going to do? Yeah, it, it's it's fascinating and terrifying at the same time. Um, I mean, we know that China carries the greatest stroke burden in the world. And so when we see a retrospective study from China that looks at over 200 patients with COVID-19 and only 5% have acute ischemic stroke and less than 1% have cerebral venous thrombosis or intracerebral hemorrhage, looking at that going, that doesn't make any sense because we know they have more than that. And then even in this country, as I talk to my colleagues across the country, um, we're not seeing it. We don't know where these patients are going or where they're hiding. We're not seeing acute ischemic stroke. We're not seeing intracerebral hemorrhage and we're not seeing subarachnoid hemorrhage, but nobody can explain why. We collectively fear that they're staying home with their strokes. They're afraid to come into the hospital. And in fact, they may have been listening to us when we said, stay home. But we really want that message to be clarified. If they have symptoms of a stroke or a severe sudden onset headache, we really want them to call their doctor and consider that this could be something neurologic and time sensitive. And so, you know, we, we are seeing some patients with stroke. So what are we doing with that? Well, the Heart Association put together this interim stopgap um, opinion document for the care of stroke patients, because you know that we've been saying forever, got to get those patients in fast. We've got to assess them quickly. We've got to get them thrombolytics quickly if they're going to qualify for them. And we've got to get them to mechanical thrombectomy. Everything has to be really fast. Well, now the paradigm has shifted. We know that we still want true stroke patients to get their treatment and assessment quickly, but we have to put the clinician's safety first. So every stroke, every stroke code patient should be treated as potentially infected with COVID. We should be using telemedicine and other different practice patterns as much as is appropriate to protect clinicians. We shouldn't go running in the room uh, to try to figure out what's going on. And then when we talk about patient selection, treatment times, time to treatment, time to needle, time to door, uh, door to drug, all that stuff. Um, those are goals now. They're not expectation, but they're goals. So we've taken a step back and said we really need to protect the clinicians taking care of these patients. And there's another thing, you know, when, when patients came in to get thrombolysis or mechanical thrombectomy, in our shop, they would all come to the neuro ICU and spend 24 hours there. So we would watch them closely to see if they had any propagation of their stroke or any bleed or anything. And we're starting to recognize even in this document that that wasn't really based in data or evidence, we don't have an, a great evidence-based reason to keep those patients in the neuro ICU. And many neuro ICUs now have been dedicated to COVID because we have a far lower volume now than the medical ICU does. So there's not a great reason to take those patients and put them in the, in the ICU for 24 hours. We're saying they can go to um, a step-down unit, they can go to a floor. We still need to keep an eye on them and we still need to monitor them for changes in their exam, but they no longer strictly have to go to the neuro ICU. 
Okay. So we we really want to get the word out there to the public that stroke is still time sensitive problem, even right. with COVID. Just like STEMI. Um, okay, excellent. So um, now we don't we have data. Uh, you know, uh, Dave Talon was mentioning that flu has the increased incidence of stroke. Um, and we know that there's a, a clotting nightmare happening here. Do we have data yet to suggest a link between COVID-19 and stroke? Is there anything solid there? Uh, nothing solid. The, the, there's theorizing and there's the thinking about um, the thrombotic effect, but nothing that I could really put out there. So that's one thing that we got to look at. And the other thing that we have to look out for, uh, Evie, is that patients are coming off ventilators. Um, and Peter has seen this where they're not the same, there's symptoms happening afterwards, we might be dealing with some delayed issues that are coming, you know, we're gonna to need to follow these patients and see uh, some funny neuro things are happening. I think that might be just even independent of the things that happen when you're on neuromuscular blockade in the ICU, people are reporting some chronic neuro symptoms. So we should, we should definitely have you back to talk about that. So That's very, very true. Much. It's yeah. very true. And we really need to keep looking at the patient's right. neuro exams, even though they have COVID and we're so focused on the respiratory. All right. So helpful. Thank you so much, Evie. So we're going to move along uh, to uh, Sean Nort. Uh, and I was saying that Sean never gets his due. Um, uh, you know, well, we just, uh, we just say it's Sean, but Sean is an associate dean at the Chapman uh, University uh, School of Pharmacy. And uh, we're going to talk uh, about a uh, quick update. And so let me just take us uh, back to start with, uh, Sean, to the breaking news, the VA study. This is an American study, 368 patients that uh, Mel brought up. Uh, what's your take? Yeah. So, you know, the train stopped rolling with this one. So this was just hot off the presses, right? I mean, we were two hours before starting and we get this study. So you might have heard, and if you're not, what we're telling you that the NIH uh, advisory panel just came out with their official position that said hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin really has no role outside of a clinical trial in the treatment or prophylaxis of any patients suspected or having COVID. So that's huge. And some of that is based on this study that was just uh, presented. Now, this is on the, uh, uh, it hasn't been peer reviewed yet, but as Stuart mentioned, this is all VA patients that were uh, COVID uh, positive. So they had a total of 368 patients and they were uh, either on hydroxychloroquine and those were 97 patients, hydroxychloroquine plus azithromycin, those are 113 or didn't get any of these therapies. And they looked, this is a retrospective study, but they looked at two outcomes. One is death and one is need for mechanical ventilation. And the most dramatic of this is if you look at the patients who are on hydroxychloroquine as a solo agent, had 27% mortality compared to 11% in the patients that had no therapy. And if you looked at the combination, that mortality was 22%. Now, if you compare the 27% with the 11%, that does reach statistical significance. The other outcome of which none of this meant statistical significance, but just looking at absolute numbers is there really was no difference with need for ventilation. It was 13%, 7%, and 14%. Again, we're talking small numbers. The inference is this is probably cardiovascular related, meaning dysrhythmias in these uh, sick patients. Now, we don't know how sick they were, but a number of them required ventilation, so they had to be on the more severe side. So uh, we've been kind of pounding this drum uh, privately, me, Stuart, and Mel, that uh, this drug's not ready for prime time outside of any clinical trials. And this is the problem when it gets into the popular press because I was just on a webinar of uh, a Department of Medicine Grand Rounds and they just showed six different institutions across the country that every patient who was admitted gets put on hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, pretty standard. And so we are going to see data probably, unfortunately, that there's gonna be a higher mortality with all of this. All right, so exactly. And so the other thing that we should mention that's pretty pretty newsworthy is the NIH uh, has uh, based not on what we just heard, right? No, no, uh, it was but, all, but it was based all on the today. preceding, yeah, pre yeah, the preceding data, uh, essentially along the same lines, which is, uh, you know, there's a potential for harm here. Uh, the evidence is mounting, uh, and there isn't a, a signal for efficacy yet. So 
uh, you know, caution, caution, caution. Let's uh, quickly uh, go over some of the other things, Remdesivir, that we covered uh, in detail in terms of the mechanism last time. Uh, probably most people have heard at this point that there was a, a famous leaked audio of one of the investigators at University of Chicago that was uh, uh, suggesting that there might be some uh, uh, outcomes, uh, but we really don't have any uh, any uh, any actual data yet. Sean, did you want to make any comments on that? Yeah, it, probably people have seen this. This has been all over, you know, the news uh, programs and, you know, particularly in the investment world, Forbes, Bloomberg stuff, Gilead stock took a huge jump. But this was a uh, so preliminary uh, data of 113 patients that was presented at the University of Chicago that sounds like for all intents and purposes, it was a closed faculty meeting that somehow someone recorded and it was leaked out that showed uh, a lot of patients did well and they were all quote unquote severe disease, which we have no idea what that meant, except that they had to have fever to be enrolled. But they said that a lot of these patients didn't even require the full 10 day course of therapy. Many of them were discharged within, you know, a week or, right. or so, but right. we really have to wait. I mean, it's- And really my big tense. concerns there, uh, just to remind everyone were that that was not a randomized, uh, there's not a Absolutely, control arm in that study. Right. Um, and we don't really, it, it seems that they might not have been that sick. Uh, and yeah. that was my concern and two of them died. Me so too. we really don't know enough to say. Um, IL-6 IL inhibitors, uh, tocilizumab, uh, which I, I learned how to pronounce. Um, yeah, we talked about uh, still in trials. We talked about the uh, mechanism, the potential there. Uh, very fascinating stuff. Convalescent plasma, uh, still uh, ongoing trials. Uh, actually, uh, at the site uh, where uh, um, Mike Katz was at that we interviewed, uh, my wife also works there uh, in that system. And I can see that they've got uh, ongoing trials. Uh, they're part of that system. So we're hopefully getting data there. Uh, but today, just like all days, Hang on, uh, we have to go, oh, I'm frozen. Are we frozen? No, okay. We have a featured drug. Every, every, uh, every week we have a new drug that we just wanna say just a little bit more about. And this month, uh, or this week, Sean, it's the JAK inhibitors. Just tell us about this possibility. Okay, so JAK inhibitors, we uh, will preface this by saying we are quite lukewarm on these drugs, but we are trying to let people know if they hear more and more about these drugs that they become familiar with, you know, what they are and you have a kind of a general understanding of how these work. And so I don't know if you can bring up the slides, Stuart. I think I'm, can you see it? No. I don't see it. Okay. Nope. I'll try it again. I'll try it again. It's okay. okay. Well, while Stuart's working on that, I'm going to let you know. So these JAK inhibitors, these are used for rheumatoid arthritis, myelofibrosis, uh, uh, a lot of different diseases, but pr predominantly uh, RA. And there's a number of them. Okay. There you go. So we'll go to one of them. Actually, if you could go one back. Perfect. So you heard Evie talking about COVID-19, which has this high affinity for this ACE2 receptor. And the ACE2 receptor, it binds to it, and then it uh, needs to be taken within the cell. And it does this through endocytosis. And this endocytosis is mediated by uh, different kinases. And two of the kinases are this one called AAK1 and another one called GAK. Now, baricitinib is one of these JAK inhibitors. And it has this ability to inhibit both of these kinases. And the thinking is, well, if you can't have endocytosis, it can't release its uh, materials, you can't get any viral replication. Move to the next slide, please. But the way that JAK inhibitors work in general for their main functions, and baricitinib's one, but another one called ruxolitinib, they inhibit JAK, and JAK stands for uh, Janus uh, Kinase Inhibitors. And what they do is they mediate cytokines, but they're very, they're not very specific. And that's the problem with these. So if you look at the IL-6 receptor inhibitor inhibitors that we talked about uh, last week, they are very specific for IL-6. So some people that are pro will say, well, that's the highest cytokine we're seeing. This makes the most sense. But then you have people, there's other cytokines in, involved. But some of these cytokines are actually beneficial or we think they're beneficial. So these, I, we just wanted to make sure people, if they hear about JAK inhibitors, have a little bit of an understanding of how they might work, but just know that we are very lukewarm about these. And that same NIH advisory panel actually recommends against the routine use of JAK inhibitors where they're kind of equivocal when it comes to the IL-6 uh, receptor inhibitors. All right, so then just to summarize, hydroxychloroquine, 
uh, things are looking precarious. Remdesivir, we're waiting. ILS uh, inhibitors, we're waiting. Convalescent plasma, we're waiting. And Jack, we're not even... We're, you we're, don't we're know waiting. Jack. We're waiting. We don't know Jack. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Okay. So um, I'm going to, uh, let's just uh, um, stop sharing and I'm going to get uh, our next, uh, introduce our next segment. We're going to talk uh, uh, a little bit. We're going to show a segment uh, from Jess Mason's uh, recent social media posting. Uh, and she's going to uh, discuss some really important. We've we've kind of talked about some of these themes, but these are some really important uh, themes that are coming up uh, with ED volumes and whether patients are coming and and her take on it. So let's uh, listen to her, and then we're going to get back to discuss it. We asked patients to stay at home, and they listened. But I am very concerned that they took this message a little bit too far. Now, what we meant when we said stay at home was, hey, if you feel like you have a, a cold or a, a bit of a flu, but you feel well enough to be home, that's who should stay home. Assume that you have COVID and stay home. And if it's something that you could call your primary doctor for, then great, do that first. But I think way too many patients are staying home who actually would normally be coming to see us and should be seeing us in the emergency department. And now the bigger concern in many parts throughout the country is that patients just aren't even coming into the ER at all. So if you're not on the extreme end where you're seeing just an overwhelming number of cases of COVID, places like New York and New Jersey, you might be on the other extreme. And that's, I think, where Fresno is right now. And a lot of other places are in the same boat where not only did the respiratory illness patients stay home, but everyone else did too. And ED volumes are plummeting. Many cases, uh, hospitals are reporting that volumes are down by 50%. 70%. These numbers are scary. And Boston Medical Center actually had to furlough 700 employees. And this is scary because then what if the surge comes and now we're down on staffing? We've got nurses and techs going home. We're cutting shifts for ER docs and APPs. And then what if the surge comes? So this is very concerning. People who are having STEMIs, for example, a paper is in pre-press for the journal from the American College of Cardiology from Jack, and they showed a 38% decline in STEMIs. And this was at multiple centers throughout the country. So are patients not having STEMIs? Well, of course they are. They're just staying home and they're gonna go into heart failure. And then they're gonna come in very, very sick. So what can we do about this? Well, we pushed this message on the public, please stay home. And it was overly effective. It made people fearful. I think we need to backpedal a little bit on that. We need to add some clarity. We need to respect our patients that they're smart and that they can figure this out if we empower them a little bit. So I've been reaching out to our local media and trying to get this message across. Hey, if you're worried and you would normally have come to the ER, please come and see us. Check with your primary doctor if you want, and you can work it out with them and they can help decide whether to send you. But if you can't get in with your primary, you gotta come to the ER and do everything to inform patients how you're gonna protect them from possible exposure to COVID. So I'm trying to get the message out of what we're doing. And what we're doing is we're keeping those non-COVID patients separate. Now I know this isn't perfect, right? There's people who are asymptomatic who have it and there are at the supermarket also, but we have to take, take care of these patients in the safest way possible. So we're separating them from anyone who has potential respiratory symptoms. We're providing them with a mask. We're all wearing masks. So we're trying to minimize the risk of exposure. You might even be safer coming to the ER than going to the grocery store because everyone's wearing masks for sure. So try to reach out to your local media. Try to do a little bit of PR and get the message out there that, hey, if you're sick and you would otherwise have come to the ER, you should probably still come in and we're going to protect you the best that we can. That was so well said. Um, and so we're going to come back to that, uh, Peter, uh, after we talk a little bit about the surge in terms of uh, your perspective on whether that's a model that's, you know, that fits everyone to have those two streams of, of patients. Um, let me just uh, introduce Peter. Um, try not to embarrass him. Um, so, can everyone see that uh, that picture? No, there's no picture. There. Oh, there's no picture. Oh, hang on, hang on. <laughs> okay. Oh, I'll just embarrass myself. No, okay. Let's see. Let me share that properly. I got to get this. All right. 
Now we got it. Now we got it, right? Can we all see that? Yes? Yeah, we see it. Yep, see it. And what and what do you think of that? Now, everyone, that is Stony Brook, okay, hospital that you hear so much about. And uh, when I went there to visit Peter and Billy, I looked at that thing. I mean, Mel's comment was, when does that thing take off? And I just looked at Peter and he said to me, the architect killed himself. And, uh, and I thought, yeah, that, that's, about, that's about right. That has got to be the most hideous structure on earth, Peter. That's what I got to say. But beautiful things happen inside it, I understand. Uh, Peter is a professor and he's the vice chair at Stony Brook University Hospital. Um, and Stony Brook, uh, as you've probably heard in Long Island, uh, particularly uh, hit bad. Uh, and so Peter, uh, we just want to ask you just first before we get into the details of how, how people should prepare for the surge, which is something that you know a little bit about over the years. Um, just what was your experience? Just tell us as a doc, uh, tell us about the Stony Brook experience as this, this ride happened. So well, well, unshare, unshare your uh, thing so we can see Peter's beautiful face. Uh, hi, Mel. I'm sorry that I didn't uh, provide my beautiful face tonight, but uh, we shall we shall try anyway. Can you hear me okay? Hearing you great. Okay. So we started at the beginning of February with our first patient and everybody got real excited. We thought maybe we'd see three or four patients and get even more excited about it. Uh, after about a week after our first patient, we had three patients in the ICU and we had five patients on the floor. And about two weeks later, we had 60 patients in the ICU and we had 200 patients on the floor. And over this period of time, we've seen about 5,000 patients that have, it's just soared up and soared down. Um, uh, uh, it's, it's been very, uh, it, it's been one hell of a ride. Of, of, from the start, I think that we made a few mistakes, is that we believed that you could pick out the person that had the corona and the one that didn't. Oh, it was the travel history, and then it was the fact that they had uh, infectious sort of symptoms. But after we had a stroke that had uh, coronavirus, we had a trauma that had coronavirus, we had a STEMI that had coronavirus, we figured out that we had to treat everyone as if they were a potential coronavirus. And it was during that period of time before we decided that, that we had healthcare professionals get infected. And we admitted patients to the hospital and some of the hospitalists got infected. So David mentioned that the, there was a low rate. I, want, I would prefer a rate of zero rather than a rate of three or 4% or, or whatever the percent is. But early on, we decided we needed to mask all of the time. And we did a few things. We would, wear, we would wear the N95 all day long and we would put surgical mask on top of that. And paradoxically, I'm curious to hear Dave's opinion on this. Paradoxically, I think because we had limited supplies and had to wear a mask all day long without taking it off, it actually protected us. And uh, because then you couldn't touch your, your, uh, your mouth and your nose. Uh, uh, before you finally washed your hands, took it off and, and went home. Since we started doing that, as far as I know, not a single staff member in the emergency department has gotten infected. And that's over 5,000 patients that we've seen. We have had two people that, uh, that I know that got infected, but they had a family member that was infected before them. So I'm going to guess that they did not pick that up at work. But the bottom line is that PPE works. Trying to pick out the one that has it and the one that doesn't clearly does not work. So uh, I was concerned, I'm concerned when I hear about split flow, meaning there are people that you don't have to worry about and there are people that you do. I think that's a big mistake because you, if you do get COVID, you're gonna be exposed to people uh, along the way that you, that you can't uh, appreciate. Um, uh, 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 another thing that we saw was, uh, 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 I'm sorry, instead of doing that sort of split flow, we did the sick versus not sick split flow. So we built the tent 
and all of our patients who were PUIs, who, who we were worried that they might have the infection, if they were between 18 and 65, they didn't have comorbidities, their pulse ox was good, we sent them over to the tent, they were seen there, they were checked. We did have a fair number of people who did have positive chest x-rays and their pulse oxes were 92, 93, 94%. We sent a substantial number of those home and we've had very, very few bounce backs. However, in saying that, I must say we've not yeah. done contact tracing, so we don't know whether they went to another hospital right. or died at home or, or, or whatever else. Uh, but we couldn't possibly admit all of those patients uh, uh, to the hospital. So our, our volume took off like this, and social distancing uh, happened right when we were sharp on the upstroke. And just in this last week, we've seen a plateau, and now we've seen a dive. And uh, our volume has actually been quite low now. I think we're seeing a little bit of a bump from people violating Easter and Passover, but we are not seeing near the volume that we saw before. A few all things right. that, that we all recommended, no white coats, nothing below the elbows. Uh, in, t in Toronto, when they had the SARS outbreak, they were able to culture the virus under wedding rings, under uh, watches. So everybody tries to keep clean below the uh, below the elbows. Um, another thing that we did so that so many people wouldn't have to go in the room of COVID patients is that we put iPads in the room and we use an iPad, uh, we use an app where you could connect to that iPad and have a video conference either from your iPhone, from an iPad or from the computer. So I would go in the room to see the patient, but then once I was done with them, for instance, if they had to be admitted by the hospitalist, the hospitalist would just do a telemedicine encounter with them. And, and it not only saved them from exposure, but it saved a lot of PPE use and this sort of thing. Look, if, uh, and finally, if this doesn't happen to you, that's great. But I think when you start to see your first cases, you need to anticipate that it may explode. Some of the things we did, uh, the, our hospital administration was absolutely phenomenal about this. They planned out additional medical wards. They planned out additional ICUs. And the mantra was there was no one that was going to be sitting in the waiting room of the emergency department. And there was no one that was going to be boarded in the emergency department. So when we started to collect people, the next day they would open up a medical ward. When we had more ICU patients than we had ICU beds, they opened up another ICU. Sometimes they would do one every couple of days. In order to do that, you have to start planning way behind as to where you're going to do it, what your staff's going to be, what your equipment's going to be, and where you're going to pull them from. But if you, you should plan that, and if you never have to use the plan, you know, God bless you, you're lucky, and it's wonderful. But there are areas of the country where this is going to explode. And you need to, when you see that rapid uprise, you better have this uh, all set to go or else there's going to be hell to pay. Now, now, Peter, I just, can everyone see, this is such a neat tool. Can everyone see where I'm highlighting now? Yes. Split flow ED. So I just, before we move on to, uh, hang on, let me just stop sharing. Just before we move on, uh, I, I want to make sure that we fully parse that that yin and yang, that tension between the split flow that uh, Jess was talking about, keeping part of the emergency department for non-COVID patients, uh, and the split flow that you utilize, which is you assume everyone's COVID, as it, and and then you just you know sick and not sick is your basic triage. Um, and the argument uh, I think for the former was that wow, the patients will be too scared to come in unless we have these separate areas, and and uh, maybe. Uh, maybe these are both right and it has to do with the timing or do you think that it's just pretty much you always have to assume everyone is COVID? I well, just want to make sure that I we think fully the parse staff, that out. The staff has to treat everybody as if they're COVID. Also, patients coming in with sprained ankles and whatever, they are more than happy to wear a mask. They don't feel like they need it for themselves. They need it to protect themselves. But if you, if you run an emergency department where you're not sitting in the waiting room and you're brought into a private room, so there's, there's, there's no one uh, uh, coughing their lung cheese on the wall next to you, uh, the patient feels relatively safe. They don't know if they're in an area that has it or doesn't have it because you have them in a, in a room unto themselves. But the, I think that 
you know, Jess was talking about uh, uh, this uh, promotional video of, for people to stay away. I don't know if you noticed, but people were staying away before that. We were seeing 250 patients a day. We continued to see 250 patients a day, but all of them were people with respiratory illnesses. All the other patients just sort of went away before any of this stuff about, oh, please keep us safe so we can keep you safe. Now, why is that? Last year, about a third of the population in the United States went to the emergency department. And when they went there, they were sitting in a waiting room and waiting for four or five hours to be seen, sitting next to the guy that's coughing and the next to the guy that's thunder chucking in a, in a bag that's got Ebola. Uh, uh, they, are, they know from watching the news, oh my God, if I get Corona, I'm going to die. So this is, their, this is what an emergency department is to them. It's somewhere where you're going to come, you're going to sit in a waiting room and, and, and that needs to happen. I think our message needs to be not to the public. I would like the message to the public to be, come here and let us take care of you and we will keep you safe. But to make that real, we need to have a message to somebody else. We need to have a message to our administrators, to CMS, to the Joint Commission, to the Department of Health. We can no longer have a waiting room for emergency departments. We can no longer board patients because we need to bring people in to see them. We need to be able to rapidly see them and turn them around and either get them out or get them upstairs. Once we do that, then we can look to the public and say, come here, we will care for you and we will keep you safe. Until we do that, it's just a marketing ploy, I think. Peter, I wanna ask a question or make a statement or something. And first of all, I wanna apologize uh, the power went out for the area. I spent $20,000 on Tesla Powerwalls. It's worked miraculously until tonight, of course, and it didn't back up my um, power. But um, the, I think the specific thing that we have a problem with is if you're early in the disease, the prevalence in the population is low. Um, what Fresno and Jess was finding is that they were bur burning through an enormous amount of PPE before they needed to. And so that's why there was this concern like if you can't turn it on now because we don't have enough PPE to be COVID all the time once we uh, have enough PPE yes COVID all the time but they were like we're blowing through all this stuff we're not going to have it when we need it so that's the point about at some point you have to go okay the prevalence in the community is starting to tick up enough for us to go okay everybody in the hospital it's everybody's got COVID from now on but there's some point before that if you don't have extraordinary amounts of PPE that you can't do that or you'll blow through it before you need it. So if you don't have enough PPE so that you can have an N95 mask that you can wear for two days straight or have surgical masks that you can put over that, that you can also wear through your shift, then I think you have a real damn, you have a huge problem. But, and I think there's, a, you, I think there's a lot of places you, like that, particularly in rural medicine areas. Yeah. They've got very little and they better use it when they need it. You know, it, it's, you know, if you wear a cloth mask or, or a, a, you know, a Nixon mask over your head, I, I don't care what it is. Uh, when you see, once you have people in your community with the infection, you're going to see other people with that infection. And you need to do, I think, everything you can to protect yourself. Yeah, you and, you know, yeah. And we've had, listen, we've had colleagues, uh, several of them, both nurses and doctors that have been dismissed from their jobs because they were wearing N95 masks. Um, and we've advocated on behalf of those people. And a lot of them were absolutely right. And so we're, we're pretty sensitive to this. No, it, again, it's, it's, I, I think it's, uh, you really, really need to be cautious with this. As we all have seen, everybody on this conference call, we all have seen horrible, horrible cases. And they're not just an old folk like me. I've had 20 year olds, 30 year olds that have devastating disease. Uh, we have had uh, uh, staff members that have been extremely sick, have had to be in the ICU. We fortunately have not left, lost anybody uh, uh, yet in our institution. But uh, this is not something that, this does not make for happy campers. People do right. not want this disease. So if you, have, if you have the luxury of having minimal PPE to protect yourself, if it's just a mask uh, of any sort, 
once you have it in your community, wear a mask the whole time you're at work. Yeah. Okay. So um, I think that's, you know, that's, it's, it's hard to argue with that. Um, anyway, as uh, more information comes in on that, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll circle back to it. Uh, one of the things that we had, we had some pretty heated discussions actually over the past couple of days over what should the message be for the public? What should we be saying? You know, we swung the, the pendulum one way and it's so complicated because on the one hand, you have to be straightforward and simple with the messaging. You can't have a complicated nuanced answer that requires them to go through a, you know, a triage system on their own. Um, and on the other hand, you know, we can't have the situation where people are not coming uh, for with their strokes and their heart attacks and and we can't start listing certain disease you know if it's a stroke come in if it's a chest pain come in we can't do that it's not going to work and so um i i'm loath to come up with a, a policy or blanket statement it might be that we have to just put it all out there hash this all out together and leave it for people in their individual communities and in their individual emergency departments to decide what messaging works in their communities that's all i can come up with for now i don't i don't think we can be too much more dogmatic i mean we, the board. we may we may need to make uh, it a very public, uh, we may need, mean it, blah, blah, blah. we may need to create great public awareness that patients with heart attacks and strokes aren't coming to the hospital and they need to. Uh, All right. I, I think, I think that's an, an, an important thing to do, but. The, and I'm but sure we're going to get lots of, we're going to get lots of uh, feedback on that and we're going to probably yeah. have more but to the, say about it. But the fear that people had preceded any, any messaging on our part. They're just scared because they think they're going to be sitting next to a COVID patient. Okay, now uh, I want to bring in, uh, um, it's a pleasure to bring in uh, Susie Demeester. Uh, Susie is faculty at the University of Michigan, um, and she's an attending emergency physician at St. Joseph Mercy. Um, and she's going to talk about, I think, what is the most interesting topic of the night, and she, and she actually brought pictures. So uh, take it away, Susie. Tell us about the DER manifestations that you've been seeing. Well, thank you, Stuart. Um, you, you all see me? Yep. All right. Well, thank you. I am extremely flattered by your t-shirt. We're feeling that love here in Ann Arbor. And um, I wanted go to blue. talk a little about, yep, go blue. Wanted to talk a little bit about COVID in the skin. Um, so COVID has already proven itself a great masquerader. And I think we need to add dermatologic manifestations to the list. Um, based on the original studies in China, only 0.2% were documenting any kind of skin involvement. Um, but what we're, we're seeing now based on the Italian experience, what we're seeing in the US is that number could be closer to 20%. And we've talked about how COVID affects the hematologic, the vascular system. And I think this is probably the underlying mechanism when we're talking about COVID and the skin. And so there's been many reported nonspecific rashes with COVID, things like diffuse erythema, vesicular rashes like varicella. I had a patient with COVID whose chief complaint a few weeks ago was widespread urticaria. And so very similar to those cutaneous involvements we see with a lot of vi viral exanthems. And so maybe not super helpful to us in the emergency department. Uh, but I think there's a few skin findings that are unique to COVID. And I think we all need to know about them and be aware of them. So it's important to, put these to also- up? Do you want me to put up the, uh, any of these Sure, I can, kind of, um, I can kind of cue you. I'm going okay. to talk about three specific things, but keep in mind that these are common in the general population. And so we all need to inquire about chronicity. So first, number one, um, libido reticularis. So this is that lacy appearing kind of skin modeling we will see in severely septic patients. Uh, and it's theorized to be caused by microemboli in distal small vessels. There we go. Another one to keep in mind, again, the theme is vascular, is acrocinosis, uh, which can occur in hands or on the feet. And it's characterized by persistent blue or cyanotic discoloration, and usually associated with a delay in cap refill. And then the last one, which I think is probably, or is the most important, is um, something that has been seen very commonly now with COVID and appears to be uniquely associated with COVID 
is Pernio, also known as chilblains. And so what US dermatologists are reporting is that they're seeing Pernio so frequently in children, and this is not, this is not your average pediatric diagnosis, that it's become nicknamed COVID toes. Uh, that's because it's predominantly affecting toes, although here in this picture, we can see that it's affecting uh, finger as well. Typical classic pernio is caused by repeated cold exposure. Um, the pathophysiology has always been somewhat unclear, but again, this vascular theme and thought to be some type of dysfunction that causes vasospasm. What's really interesting though with COVID that these lesions appear to represent microthrombi. And there's been no histologic examination or confirmation. And so I think it's probably more accurate for us to really call these perneo-like lesions because we're not sure if they're technically the same thing. And so what, what will you see? What you're going to see is purplish swelling of the distal digits. With COVID, we're actually seeing it mainly in the toes and hence the name COVID toes. These lesions can be firm, painful. Stu, I think there's another picture up there of uh, toes, which is a pretty good one to show too. Yep. Um, they can sometimes be intensely pruritic and uh, you can look really closely and sometimes see some punctate petechiae. Um, seems that patients are presenting kind of all over the board in terms of these being prodromal symptoms, occurring during actual symptomatic COVID, and then also in the convalescent phase. And I think given our testing limitations right now, I would assume that if I was seeing a patient in the emergency department with a new diagnosis of COVID, and this could very well be their chief complaint. This is what the dermatologists are seeing. COVID is, is pernio as their chief complaint. I would assume that this patient either is suffering from COVID or perhaps is in the convalescent phase of COVID if they're not complaining of anything else. So bottom line for everyone, if you are seeing new pernio, new acrocinosis, libido reticularis, I would consider those findings very highly suspicious for COVID. I'm gonna show those one more time. So there we go. Exhibit A, exhibit B, exhibit C, exhibit D, and I love it, the COVID toes. So we got to think about testing, Susie. We got to think about treatment though. Tell us about that. Is there any uh, treatment we should be thinking about? Well, this gets, I think, even more interesting. So classic pernio, I'm going to focus more on the pernio, but classic pernio uh, is associated often with autoimmune diseases, in particular with lupus. And advanced cases are treated with not only a high potency topical steroid like clobetazole, but also hydroxychloroquine. So very interesting. Um, dermatologists in the US, um, I don't think there's any consensus guidelines, but they are actually treating the COVID-like pernio with, um, in addition to the high dose steroids, they're using a full dose of aspirin because again, we're thinking this is related to microthrombi. So the treatment is actually different. Right. The first thing I actually thought of when, when I saw those pictures was purple glove syndrome. When I saw one of the acrocinosis things, which is what something that was rarely seen after phenytoin infusion, but, uh, uh and we used to put, uh, nitroglycerin on the, uh, the paste. And that was very helpful for that. I don't know if that's been tried for this, but if it's painful, that's probably something I would try get the flow going. All right. So that's fantastic. Uh, thank you so much, Susie. Um, there are some, uh, very, there are some burning questions. There are some questions that like 50 people have asked that we have to, that we have to get uh, to uh, the appropriate experts. So uh, Dave Tallon, we have to ask you again, sorry, about reinfectivity. People are freaking out. Can you get reinfected? It's not just, not just about the test, but can you get reinfected? People want to know. Yeah. Um, I don't know, but but I think the concern for it has come from reports, I think mostly from South Korea, where they've identified in about 2% of people with um, documented COVID infection that they have positive P PCR later after they've recovered. Um, you have to realize that PCR does not equal disease. It doesn't equal tr transmissibility. And where they have tried to isolate the virus and grow it in these same patients, they cannot grow it. 
So the presumption is that it's viral remnants, viral dust that persists. But you know, there are other there are other viruses where you can have persistent transmissibility. Um, Ebola rarely, right? It, Ebola can re, can uh, can be kept kept go can become uh, can infect the semen. Looking for the word, Stuart, help me out here. <laughs> Transmission, <laughs> transmissibility. It can it can it can be in the semen, and yes. and there has been at least one case of someone who acquired Ebola from a Ebola survivor through sexual intercourse. I think that involves semen exchange. So that could happen. We, we don't know if you know, that will happen with coronaviruses. It's not really something that happens generally with viruses um, after there is recovery like respiratory viruses. Um, and then the other question is like, okay, let's say I recover and I have my serology tested and I'm not one of those unlucky bastards that Dave Schreiger described, who's got a false positive IgG. I've got the real deal, man. And I'm like feeling so good. Like that's gotta be a good day, right? Um, uh, how, how protected are you? So it, it depends. So for RSV, you're, you, we have very little or very short protection. You can get infected with RSV again, even within the same winter season. Um, you tend not to get reinfected with specific influenza strains. And for coronaviruses, at least the ones that we understand, the four seasonal coronaviruses that cause, you know, runny nose and sore throat and stuff like that. If you, if you get through that infection in a winter season, you're, you seem to be protected at least through the year until the next winter season. And so um, let's hope, hope that that is the case for COVID-19. And, and a, year late, a year from now, we have a vaccine candidate we could use. Yeah, I mean, the bottom line is that <laughs> you, can't, you can't know some of the things that people want to know. And Peter, go ahead. Can we ask the other David to answer that? Yeah. <laughs> Peter, Dave, has, Peter want, has a comment. Yeah. Dave, I wanted to ask if, if there's been any reports with COVID or with SARS or with MERS where a reinfection was catastrophic like you like you can see for instance with dengue. Not that it, no there haven't been but dengue is a special case because there are four serotypes right I think they're called serotypes and you're at greatest risk if you get infected with one survive and the, and then get infected with another serotype and it's thought that the immune response then goes haywire because you've been re-exposed yeah. and it's been primed because of this previous infection. Well, um, there are as, 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 as far as we know, there's one strain of COVID-19 right now. So um, anyhow, I, I'm not aware of that happening. It didn't happen with SARS. I don't think it's been described with MERS and we, we haven't seen it described yet with COVID-19. Okay, so um, hopefully that that helps a little bit. Um, I have to uh, get back to uh, to Sean uh, with the perennial talks question, which is, can we use NAC uh, hey, for it, this? Can we use uh, N-acetylcysteine like we do for everything else? You use it for everything. Uh, so, so the theory is, look, this is there's a lot of oxidant stress. Uh, NAC is clearly an antioxidant. Uh, I don't think we have enough data. I know there are some trials and there's some anecdotal stuff going out there. It's safe. So, you know, we always have to look to the safety profile, but uh, I, I would not be recommending NAC right now, but it's as an antioxidant would be really what it's being purported for. Okay, I have a couple of uh, burning questions uh, for Susie about the derm stuff. A couple of things. First of all, we know there's clots. We've been talking about the D-dimer and all these clots and all this uh, vascular stuff going on. Any of these things, uh, candidates for anticoagulation that you've seen, has that been part of the discussion? I don't think currently uh, we are anticoagulating uh, just based on the, the perneo. Again, this is kind of more uh, a symptom of what's going on. Generally, the patients that are being seen by the dermatologist, this is their chief complaint. Uh, and they have no other associated symptoms. So I don't think we're anticoagulating just for just because of a skin manifestation. 
I also think the American Academy of Dermatology is probably still trying to put together some formal recommendations on treatment. Um, I know there had been a question about aspirin. We're not going to give aspirin to young kids. Um, and I think this is generally being seen more in the adolescent or the 20 year old population um, from, from what I've been reading and what I've heard from speaking with local dermatologists. Right. Um, so I think we covered that other one. Yeah. So that's a, it was a big concern, but aspirin, not in the young kids, uh, or not in kids basically. Uh, now in terms of, uh, uh, the, uh, other, there's some, there's a bunch of questions on the uh, server about plasmapheresis, plasmapheresis, remember the same sorts of things that we're talking about when we're talking about, uh, convalescent plasma. Um, but Sean, I don't know, have you heard anything specific about plasmapheresis? I haven't, but to be honest, I haven't really looked at that, but I wouldn't be surprised that some people are, particularly maybe in the pediatric, you know, quite small children who were sick, they might consider plasmapheresis, but I don't know if uh, Dave Tallon has, has any opinion on that. I don't think I've seen anything on it. Have you, Dave? I No, I have not. Yeah. Um, and uh, the other things that are uh, coming up, there's a lot of questions about uh, for the rural practitioners, you know, how do we deal with this increasing oxygen requirement and uh, when do we transfer these patients? I mean, these are very, very, I mean, this, this is like the essence of, uh, of, of what we do in these difficult clinical situations. And it's hard to uh, give sort of a, a one size fits all answer. But I do think that for the people that are asking about that, that we should uh, revisit that again uh, next week um, with our intensivist, and we should really talk about uh, transfer protocols. Uh, if anything that comes up in the meantime, we can also post that because I think that that's something that really people need to know about. Uh, so that's those are excellent questions. Uh, let me uh, put it to the faculty as a whole. If there's any comments that you wanted to make that you didn't get a chance to uh, to give tonight, Stuart, maybe I'll uh, wrap it up for us. Um, there's always more questions than we uh, can get to, but uh, first of all, thanks to all the faculty again for being here and thanks for everybody that was watching. Sorry that I lost my power. Tesla just flipped the power on right at the end. I like literally one minute ago, it's so close. <laughs> um, but I, I think we need to think about, as Susie has said and others have said tonight, that, that COVID is a systemic inflammatory syndrome. Uh, the predominant manifestation is pulmonary. The most severe form is pulmonary but think about this as a, a systemic disease and you'll get uh, less bitten in the buttocks if you think of it that way. It affects many systems and um, if we think about it that way, we'll be a little bit uh, more careful. I, I wanna reemphasize what Peter said because I don't, about if you can wear PPE, wear masks and stuff the whole shift. The only point I wanted to make is if you don't have enough, there's at some point that you should um, not use them, but I think it's absolutely right. You need to protect yourself. You are the healthcare workers. You are on the front line. If you're not there, people will die. So look after yourself. If you look at what happened in South Korea and in other Asian countries that got killed, literally, by SARS and MERS, they were so much more prepared than we were because we didn't get it. So when you look at the pictures in South Korea and stuff, they have cappers and pap I got my capper rig fitting. Um, they had all of this stuff because they saw what this could do and we didn't and we were not ready and there's lots of blame that will be sort of thrown around but now we know uh, what this can do and it's going to happen again it is a 100% inevitability this is going to happen again we need to get ready for the next one so everybody tonight thank you everybody working out there on the front lines you are heroes thank you for what you do We'll stop the stream now, but we'll keep the chat going for uh, 10 or 15 minutes because there's still lots of questions. Again, thanks to the faculty. Stuart, you are the ultimate professional, took over. Thank you for doing that. Sorry that I lost my power. Thanks everybody. <laughs> we'll see you next week. Obviously lots more to talk about next week. And for now, oh, not so much hydroxychloroquine, please. Hello, <laughs> stop it. <laughs>